Time to take a look at German rifle grenades. For this we have the Karabiner 98 Kurz equipped with a Schießbecher, literally shooting cup, that used to discharge rifle grenades. After discussing the question of why to use rifle grenades in the first place, we look at how to aim and fire the weapon according to regulation. Although this weapon might seem obscure to some of you, keep in mind that the Germans alone produced more than 60 million rifle grenades of all variants and other forces like the US also widely use them. Now why use rifle grenades at all? Well, there are several reasons for this. A rifle grenade is relatively small and simple. Yet at the same time it provides an explosive weapon with a decent range for the infantry. Furthermore, it is one of the few weapons which can be used in both direct and indirect fire mode. Thus it is extremely versatile. Additionally, unlike most light mortals, it does not need a plate or other heavy equipment. This allows the use of the rifle grenade already on squad level, whereas light mortars will usually use the platoon level or higher. Fleischer points out that small targets like glue poles were hard to hit during the First World War. Hitting the small embrasures with hand grenades had proven extremely difficult in the war, often the range was not sufficient. In their place one wanted to use rifle grenades, which were to be shot with great accuracy from rifle dischargers. They penetrated the embrasure and exploded immediately. Another issue was the lack of an intermediate explosive weapon between the hand grenade and the 8cm mortar, especially after the light mortar was removed from frontline service in 1941. Although there were some weapons that might fit here, for instance the infantry support gun or regular artillery, since they were usually located behind the infantry, yet due to their high explosive power and limited accuracy, they endangered the friendly infantry as well. Furthermore, these weapons had a certain amount of delay before they could be called in by the infantry. This problem could be solved by equipping the infantry with rifle grenades. This is also outlined by the German pamphlet for the rifle grenade from October 1942. The rifle explosive grenade is used to combat close range targets, especially behind cover, which cannot be engaged by heavy infantry weapons and artillery without endangering friendly troops or other close combat equipment. Used as a hand grenade, it replaces the stick grenade and the egg hand grenade. Furthermore, with proper grenades, the rifle grenade can also be used as an anti-tank weapon as well. The large anti-tank rifle grenade and the anti-tank rifle grenade are particularly effective means of engaging tank targets, tanks, armored reconnaissance vehicles and embrasures at close range. More on those grenades later. For now, let us take a closer look at the Schießbecher, the grenades and how everything is put together with the Kar 89K. First off, here is the Schießbecher. Note that it was also called Gewehrgranatgerät, literally rifle grenade device. It consists of the holding device that was fixed onto the rifle with the screw. The second part in the front was the Drallrohr, literally translated swirl pipe. And as you can see, it has a rifling that fits with the bottom of the rifle grenade. According to the pamphlet, there should be 8 grooves that were angled at 12 degrees. This was done for stabilization of the grenade during flight. Note, the Germans often use spin for stabilization, even for their rockets like the Nebelwerfer. The pipe or launcher had a caliber of 3 cm or 1.18 inch. Before the launcher was mounted, it was crucial that the rifle was unloaded and the barrel free of any object. Note that according to Fleischer, there were three different types of Schießbecher in total. By the way, even with the mounted rifle discharger, it was technically possible to fire regular rifle ammunition in case of emergency. The pamphlet states, if there is no time to remove the shooting cup from the rifle during a friendly break-in, or when defending against enemy break-ins, you can also shoot with the rifle cartridges when the shooting cup is attached, but only at close range. It is outlined further how the shot deviates and what to keep in mind. Now how to load and prepare the rifle discharger for firing a grenade? Well, the obvious part is to put the rifle grenade into the rifle discharger at the top. But as you might suspect, this is not all. There was also a cartouche, which literally just means cartridge, but the proper translation is propelling cartridge. It would be fired from the regular rifle to then propel the rifle grenade with the gas pressure. The pamphlet states, load the propelling cartridge belonging to the rifle grenade into the chamber of the rifle like a rifle cartridge. Close the chamber of the rifle, switch on the rifle safety unless immediate action is taken. Most of you might know that 
The Carabiner 98 Quartz used stripper clips with five cartridges as regular ammo. The Pembrev notes that it was possible to put the propelling cartridges onto those clips as well. Note that there were several types of propelling charges. The appendix of the pamphlet contains a table that notes the name, propellant charge, identifiable characteristics for which grenade it could be used and an optional commentary. The pamphlet particularly mentions that the appropriate cartridge should be used with the proper grenade due to the differences in the propellant charge and hence gas pressure. As such, cartridge and rifle grenade were shipped together. Each explosive rifle grenade, large anti-tank grenade or anti-tank grenade with an accompanying proper cartridge wrapped with a paper strip is packed in a cardboard packing case. So how did the propelling cartridge and rifle grenade interact with each other? The propelling cartridge was similar to a regular cartridge. It looked a bit different and of course the bullet was different. In this case it was made of wood that was painted to prevent humidity entering the cartridge. When the cartridge was fired, the pressure that built up propelled the rifle grenade out of the discharger. Furthermore, the wooden bullet would arm the fuse. The pamphlet specifically noted that the regular cartridge is forbidden. The use of a live cartridge of any kind in place of a propelling cartridge results in a bursting barrel and is prohibited. The next important element was the granate visier, the granite side. It again consisted of a holding device and the actual side. So let us look at the side without the rifle first. You notice there are range markings at two different locations, something that was a bit confusing at first, yet the pamphlet explains. In addition to the rest position mark at zero, the scale contains side marks for shooting distances of 50 to 250 meters for the explosive rifle grenade. The upper half of the scale contains the marks for the flat trajectory shot, the lower half of the scale contains the marks for the steep trajectory shot. The distances are engraved from 50 to 50 meters. For the intermediate distances of 25 meters, there is a short mark each. So the markings are to support the flat trajectory shot and the steep trajectory shot. Note, there was also a site that only reached 235 meters. Those are early versions when the grenades had less propellant. The pamphlet contains two tables, one for the old side and one for the larger grenades on the 250 meter side. Changing the distance was simple, by pressing the button on the side and then adjusting. Now let us try to aim with the flat trajectory. The side is set to 100 meter and as you can see, there it is still quite flat, yet at 200 meters the rifle is already at a rather steep angle and at the maximum range of 250 meter it is even steeper. Although it is important to keep in mind here that this was the flat trajectory mode. The pamphlet specifically states that this side requires right hand people and as such left-handed riflemen are not to be used. Additionally, there were problems with this side and changes to the range of rifle grenades caused further problems. As such, in September 1944 it was officially announced that the granite side was proven to be unsuccessful. As such, alternative techniques and aiming devices to aim were developed. One was with the use of the regular Stangenvisier, the tangent side of the Karabiner 98 Kurt. In some cases this was also done since the granite side did not fit, for instance the rifle 33-40, which was the carbine of the German mountain troops, the Gebirgsjäger, they could not fit the grenade side. But back to the Karabiner 98 Kurz. To aim with the tension side, one align it with certain parts of the gun, for instance the tip of the discharger or the top of the Unterring, the lower ring, which also held the ladder strap. Firing could be performed while standing, kneeling or being prone. After the safety has been switched off, it is time to take the shot. The pamphlet notes, the rifle shall be drawn into the right shoulder or if this is not possible because of the elevation of the bow, it shall be grasped as for the free hand shooting and held with both hands in a position that allows the most comfortable aiming. Although the recoil of the rifle is quite bearable, it is particularly important to grasp the neck of the butt firmly with the right hand to avoid injuries to the hand from the edges of the trigger guard. There were also some wooden holding devices that are allowed to place the rifle at certain angles ideal for a steep firing trajectory. Furthermore, it is noted that the rifle grenade is armed after 2 meters in flight. As such, it is crucial that nothing is in the flight path of the grenade or its detonation arc, especially friendly troops. But branches, bushes and camouflage are also mentioned. Before we conclude this video, let us look at some of the rifle grenades. 
Note that originally in 1942 only four different granite types were available, but this number had increased to 16 in 1945, according to Fleischer. Additionally, there were also various sub-variants as well. The first one was the Gewehr Sprenggranate, which would literally mean rifle explosive grenade. Yet the US catalog and enemy ordnance material called it anti-personal or hand grenade, which might sound a bit confusing at first. Yet this grenade could also be used as a hand grenade as well. The explosive rifle grenade can be used as a rifle and hand grenade. If you look at the blueprint, you will see that the lower part is unscrewed. This is exactly how to prepare the grenade for being used as a hand grenade. Keep the cord in mind, since it's not present in the footage. So let's see how this would be done. You would unscrew the lower end like this, yet unlike here, it would be connected with a breakaway cord. Pulling that cord would activate a burn fuse that would go off after 4.5 seconds. Be aware that according to the pamphlet, this grenade was originally painted yellow. I'm not sure if this is a polished original or reconstruction. There were also training grenades of this variant, but they were painted red. If the grenade was fired regularly, the impact fuse would be armed shortly after leaving the discharger to ensure that the grenade would also go off if it hit at a less ideal angle, there was also a fuse in the lower cap that had a runtime of 6.5 seconds. This would activate the burn fuse in the grenade that had the previously mentioned runtime of about 4.5 seconds. As such, the maximum lifetime of this grenade after firing was 11 seconds. As you can see, that little thing is quite complicated. Next is the Gewehr Panzergranate, literally live tank grenade although the US translation of anti-tank rifle grenade is perfect here. And if you look at the blueprint, some of you immediately will see that this is, yes, a hollow or a shaped charge. Because well, the charge is both hollow and shaped. When such a charge explodes, it directs the explosion into one direction, resulting in a jet of metal particles that then penetrates the armor. Similar to the other grenade, it has grooves for the rifling. The grenade used an inertia fuse that sits in the bottom part of the grenade. This was in contrast to the previous grenade that has an impact fuse at the top part of the grenade. Note, there was also a larger version of the anti-tank grenade as well that was a bit slower but had improved penetration. Now before we conclude this video, a short look at the bigger picture. These rifle discharges and rifle grenades are rarely covered or mentioned. Yet considering how many of them were produced, this is quite interesting. In total around 1.4 million discharges were produced. Likely a bit more, since we don't know the number for 1941. To put this in contrast of the famous Maschinengewehr 42, only about 0.4 million were produced. Yet what was far higher was the amount of ammo manufactured. Fleischer notes that for the anti-personal grenade alone, 38.7 million were produced from 1941 to 1945. Then another 23.8 million of the regular and large anti-tank grenade. Considering various other types, we have at least 67 million grenades produced. Although this weapon saw large scale use, the production of the rifle discharger was discontinued in May 1944. In early 1945, ammo was still produced. Yet in an overview on ammo production for April 1945, there was no mention of rifle grenade ammunition anymore. The question is, why was it discontinued? Well, actually, it seems it wasn't discontinued in use. The situation was there was a huge surplus of grenade discharges. Hahn notes that at the end of the war around 245,000 were at the front, whereas 618,000 were in the ordnance depots. Similarly, Hendrich points out there was a huge surplus and he actually cites the sources. Furthermore, he notes that the Sturmgewehr 44 was capable of reusing the rifle discharger of the car 98 k as well. As such, a switch in weapons would not require the production of a new discharger. Well, not much to add here. I hope you learned something new about the rifle grenades and especially the Schießbecher. Big thank you here to Reinhold Reisinger of the Wehrkundliche Sammlung Schloss Ebelsberg and Andreas for providing me with access and information to the equipment. Thanks to Philip for answering various small arms questions. And special thanks to Andrew for improvement on the script. As always, sources are listed in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.